Inspired by the medically accurate first film, disturbed parking lot attendant Martin finds himself lost in fantasies of becoming part of something bigger than himself. In this case, his efforts are centered around the obsession of creating the longest human digestive tract that has ever existed. But what would someone get out of doing this? And is there any actual chance in the real world of working out the logistics and finding success? As we try taking a peek into his world, we open on an emotional scene. A young lady who is trauma bonded to her fore and aft companions finds herself the living meat of a corpse sandwich. This harrowing scene is actually the ending of the first movie, which in this movie is a movie, and it's one of the worst kinds, the kind that leaves an imprint on impressionable minds. Like Martin's, Martin is a sloppy bitch, but he's also a special kind of pervert, you see. He is a man of action. He sees a motorist stranded as a result of lost keys, and as a clear sigma, is able to get this alpha all riled up just by staring at his girl. In chaotic situations, a calm mind tends to prevail, which is how Martin is able to control the situation and achieve his ideal outcome, a lesson for us all. Afterward, this sickly little twat pulls up his box fan and loads the bodies into the cargo bay with the care and confidence of a seasoned professional who has perfected his craft. Once done, he takes a moment to rewind his DVD and delicately caress his fan scrapbook, daydreaming about how delicious it would be to corrupt the flesh of the actual movie actors while consuming a non-stop stream of human centipede content. Later on, he transports his bounty to a nearby public toilet, which he intends to rent for purposes certainly not covered by the lease agreement. He's filled with a sense of joy as he works through the math and proves to be sensitive to any infringement upon that joy. With his efforts bearing fruit, he's now free to do as he pleases and soon has all of his little pretties spread out before him. He does the best he can to actualize his fantasies in between coughing fits as he is slowly overtaken by consumption. He wakes up later at home, putting off a strong indication he's carrying a fecal load. But the doctor is making his house call and you know ya boy's gotta put in a little tender time with his favorite book. So he he gets dressed quickly without cleaning up. When he first gets out, he takes a moment of pleasure in feeding his pet millipede before getting down to brass tacks. Under the auspices of delivering his new inhaler, Mother then takes this opportunity to reveal that Martin has become obsessed with the concept of a 12-person centipede, whatever that means. We also discover that their strained relationship is a result of her blaming him for his father's incarceration pursuant to the extreme sexual abuse he committed against Martin as a child. The doctor shocks all this up to boys being boys and goes on his way. He is, after all, just a pediatrician. Over a fine full English, Mother admits that she's been given serious thought to killing them both before music begins pounding in from the flat above. Her provocation of the upstairs neighbor, she hopes, will create an opportunity for death. Unfortunately, she is denied sweet release due to Martin's unwillingness to engage. He likes to be the one to initiate and is still building confidence perhaps another time. At work, Martin spends some time reviewing his medical documents so he will be prepared when the time comes for esophageal to sphincter grafting. He must break from his studies, however, when a pair of fresh victims present themselves within his garage. He makes quick work of them, having his process fairly well established by now. Afterward, he returns to his office for additional viewing, which for him is a multi-sensory experience involving ample touching and sweating and whatnot. This gets him all riled up, which prompts him to start tugging himself with sandpaper for some reason. This is witnessed by a couple of party girls who are then added to the warehouse gang. After he checks all the restraints and kills the lights, he gets a call from a talent agency. He has managed to lure one of the original movie actors by pretending that he's casting for a new high-profile cinematic adventure. He is firing on all cylinders now, and it seems nothing can stop him. However, the victims are nearly spared their fate when Mother reaches her limit and decides to go to town on Martin's slumbering torso. But he then reveals that the heap she's been thrusting into was simply a pile of bedding. 
She begins to open herself up in frustration as he slides into place. I guess she doesn't want to do it if she can't surprise him with it. Then she finds his book, which she begins to destroy like a savage before he runs her off to protect his baby, leaving us to wonder where we are with all of this. He confides in his only friend, getting in a good cry before inviting it to take a little nibble off of mommy's cheek. This reveals the sweet satisfaction derived from hurting mommy, so he continues this to completion. And then, right when he sits down for a nice meal with a docile companion, the music starts up again. He uses this as a chance to leverage his decoy for the purpose of creating an atmosphere of shock and awe, which allows him to acquire another victim. From here, he begins packing up all the essentials one might expect from any self-respecting surgical hobbyist. But first, he takes a celebratory lap at work that goes on until he's distracted by some front seat shenanigans. It happens to be the doctor and his gooey pal. Dr. Sebring admits here that while this is all super erotic, what he'd really like is to be taking a crack at Martin. He proves to be all talk though, because when Martin appears, he doesn't actually do anything. He attempts to leverage their familiarity to turn this into a positive encounter, but Martin is not having it, and since he doesn't want to deal with prepping that beard for surgery, he declines to take the doctor as a subject. He does run down the sex worker. He then gets the call that his star will be landing soon. Posing as a chaperone, he hacks his guts out while she tells him everything he never asked about the making of Human Centipede. With this final puzzle piece in place, he immediately taps her on the noggin so he can get everything set up just the way he needs it to begin his grand work. After getting everything arranged and all of his tools prepared for the procedure, he traipses around playing Duck Duck Goose with his crowbar, doinking them each on the head in order to calm them down. Down. He decides to start with the asshole from upstairs and carefully reconfigures his mouth to ensure his dirty little chicklets don't cause any bacterial issues for anyone else. At this point, his lead patient expires, but since he's in it now, he puts her with the other castoffs and continues with an 11 body configuration. Nevertheless, there's a lot of work ahead of him and little time to waste. The second subject is gently lulled awake by the feeling of a 3 inch paring knife delicately sliding in below her kneecap. Once accessible, he snips the tendons to weaken the joint, a process he repeats over and over again as he works to complete some of the necessary preliminary modifications. Then, when the time is right, he gets to digging into that booty meat with his box cutter. Despite the medical accuracy of the original film and his studious adherence to the process, he does lose some of his patience along the way. However, there are also some successful combinations coming together, so you have to just take the good with the bad. And through this philosophy, he eventually demonstrates, truly, that perseverance and hard work are all one needs to achieve success. Once he's done, he takes a victory lap with the mirror so they can all see the greater whole of which they each comprise a small part. But also, it's only 10 folks at this point, so any sense of pride should be somewhat tempered. This isn't for show though, it's time to get the machine fired up. He starts by attempting to feed the head some canned chili now, in the hopes she'll make some trouser chili later. But she declines to do her duty, which requires Martin to get out the funnel and slide the tube deep down her gullet. He then force feeds her a can of chowder. This sets his centipede to screaming non-stop, so he makes an ad hoc modification by removing her tongue. Then he massages his pet's tummy to help ensure the digestion is moving along. But nature takes time, and we don't like that, so he introduces a laxative into the equation, sending a raging rapid of pre-masticated nourishment exploding down the line. After letting that marinate for a bit, Martin begins to feel a little tingle in his bathing suit area. For some unknown reason, this translates into him wrapping a length of barbed wire around his joint and violently defiling his creation. Meanwhile, a previously discarded victim spontaneously wakes up beneath the death tarp and darts out of the building. She manages to get away in a gratuitously nasty scene that it would be pointless to even attempt to show here. Inside, the chain breaks off and begins to slowly drift in two different directions, which is not very centipede-like. With the experiment apparently over, Martin returns and begins to mercifully execute the back half. While that's going on, the front half manages to momentarily kill the lights, which doesn't really provide them any advantage. 
Martin continues down the line until he runs out of ammo and then begins to mangle their necks. He has a soft spot, however, for his favorite actress, and it stays his hand. This proves to be a huge mistake as she nards him and then crams a funnel in his tuchus. She uses this to introduce the centipede to his internal workings. He stabs her for it and then stumbles out, apparently having failed to learn the lesson of the first movie, which is that no one makes it out alive. Potentially, I didn't see it. All right, now that that's done, we'll check it off our list and never speak of it again. Good concept for bringing out a sequel on a thin premise, but I think overall this one didn't really have enough of anything other than gore to make it worthwhile. For something a little lighter to cleanse the palate, click on this video next. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching. Thank you.